Let us introduce our topic today. First, let me introduce myself. I'm Professor Mizan Khan, Deputy Director of the International Center for Climate Change and Development. I will serve as the moderator. Uh, today's topic you already have seen. Uh, the topic is about governance of uh, solar radiation modification, challenges and opportunities for the LDCs. Uh, uh, this event is organized by Climate Change Governance Initiative based in Geneva. Uh, the objective of this conference is to raise awareness of the SRM, solar radiation modification, among the LDC actors and uh, enhance, strengthen their understanding. You all know solar radiation management is kind of a new technology being discussed at the at this moment at the research level, research and the studies level, it's an untested technology. Um, I saw in one literature that there are 54 types of uh, solar uh, radiation modification, of which uh, stratospheric aerosol injection is the most discussed. But we can have a carbon dioxide removal through another technology through massive plantation. But solar geoengineering is a little different, uh, which is the subject of our student. And there are lots of issues involved in solar radiation, SRM, like its governance, for example, its economics, geopolitics, its social ac acceptability, the uh, question of uh, equity or distribution of power, who will do what, how they will do, what, uh, what are the inherent dangers and challenges. So these are the issues that uh, we uh, will discuss today. The purpose is to raise the issues and uh, enhance our understanding of, it is still an untested technology. Uh, we don't know, but this has been um, uh, discussed because there is not uh, much uh, ambition in mitigation. IPCC reports and all those you see, total emission reductions are going up and up uh, uh, from major emitter countries, uh, except some from some European countries. So this is the issue today. Uh, we have now, let us start our, our uh, session with the first keynote presenter. Um, uh, the keynote presenter is Ines Angela Chameleon. Uh, she is a professor of the Department of Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences uh, School of Sciences at the University of Buenos Aires. So, uh, Ines, you have the floor, please. I hope you may have slides so you can screen share. Okay, thank you very much. I will share my, my screen, yes. Okay, I hope you can see it. So I, I will talk about how the uh, last assessment of the IPCC addressed solar radiation modification. And IPCC works uh, in three different working groups and produces reports uh, in each of these working groups. The first one is the, the working group on physical science basis. And, and the report was uh, approved by governments in August 2021. The second report of the IPCC is related to the working group two and is on uh, impacts adaptation and vulnerability. And this uh, report was approved by governments in February 2022. And the last and, uh, working group is related to mitigation of climate change. And uh, the report is uh, being uh, discussed now during these this days by governments. And it will be approved uh, probably uh, during by the end of, of this week. So in the First two uh, reports approved by IPCC, the, the one from working group one and the one from working group two, in both reports are um, assessments related to solar radiation modification. So today I will present some of the key messages that uh, come from these um, reports. And 
the the first thing is how IPCC in some way defines solar radiation modification, and this definition comes from the glossary uh, from Working Group One of IPCC, and. SRM or solar radiation modification uh, refers to a range of uh, different um, radiation modification measures or, or options uh, that seek to limit global warming, to limit the, the increase in global temperature. And these measures are not related to mitigation of greenhouse gases. This means these measures are not related to um, um, to, to limit the, the emissions of CO2 and other greenhouse gases. And these, these measures, uh, these SRM, SRM measures are, um, has the, the aim to, to reduce the amount of incoming solar radiation that uh, reach the surface. And there are also other uh, technologies related to, is, to SRM that act on the long wave radiation budget. And then they, these measures tend to reduce the optical thickness uh, of uh, some type of, of clouds. And also this, this method reduce the lifetime of, of these clouds. We will talk in detail of, of these options in this next slide. IPCC refers to different, uh, to five different uh, measures or, or technologies related to this um, solar radiation modification. Uh, the first one is the stratospheric aerosol injection. And this option consists of injecting uh, aerosols or the precursor gases into the stratosphere to, to scatter sunlight back to the space. The, the, the objective of this is to, to inject in the stratosphere. This means in the atmosphere in between 15 kilometers and 25 kilometers height, uh, some kind of, of particles of small particles or, or aerosols that uh, the aim is to, to reflect more solar radiation back to the space. And this technology is the, the most research proposal of, of SRM. The second one is the marine cloud brightening. And this technology consists of injecting sea salt or, or other types of aerosols um, with the objective to increase the albedo of the albedo of marine stratocumulus clouds. There are also two other technologies. They may come together, but uh, the aim of these technologies is to, to change the albedo of the surface. And this could be of the ocean or, or the land surface. And with the, the same objective to, to increase the proportion of solar radiation that is uh, sent uh, sent back to, to the space. And this can be done, for example, in the, in the ocean by creating some uh, micro bubbles or uh, in the land in um, adding reflective materials to, to the surface, for example, uh, to increase uh, desert albedo or, or change it, changing the albedo of, of roofs in, of buildings in, in cities. To, to increase also this uh, reflectivity. And also there can, uh, there can be uh, made some changes in, in the sea ice also to, to increase the, the proportion of solar radiation that is sent back to the space. And the last uh, option of SRM is related to cirrus cloud thinning. And this technology involves the, to the reducing of, of the amount of cirrus clouds and also to increase the, the amount of long wave radiation that is uh, sending back to, to space. So also these five technologies are in, in these two reports from IPCC. 
uh, only three of them are uh, assessed in, in more details in more detail, and this is the stratospheric aerosol injection, marine cloud brightening, and cirrus cloud thinning. So the key messages I will present are mostly related to these three technologies. So these key messages are the first one is that SRM could fully or partially offset the global mean temperature increase. And also it can potentially ameliorate some of the climate change risk. And these uh, results are more confident when we consider the, the option of stratospheric aerosol injection instead of the other options of marine cloud brightening or the cirrus cloud thinning. The second key message is related that this offset that could be done through this uh, technology of, of SRM uh, could be imperfect when we consider the regional and the seasonal scales and some potential changes in climate other than uh, the potential cooling or, or reducing the, the warming could be uh, uh, fine. And these are related to, for example, changes in precipitation and, for example, reduction in some of the monsoon regions. Also changes in runoff, both in mean runoff and extreme runoff in some basins. Uh, also some potential delay in the ozone recovery. This means some ozone uh, depletion in the stratosphere and also changes in the UV radiation that uh, we receive uh, at, at the surface. And also there could be some uh, impacts, negative impacts on human and, and natural systems. For example, changes in, in crop yields and changes in land and ocean ecosystem productivity and, and photosynthesis could also be altered because of SRM. Other key, key messages that, that come from the IPCC reports uh, said or show that SRM induced cooling uh, could increase carbon stocks over land and, and ocean and also that the atmospheric CO2 could be slightly reduced by SRM. But however, uh, in comparison to, to this, uh, some positive results uh, of uh, SRM, uh, for example, ocean, ocean acidification would continue. And there, if we continue to, to emit CO2 uh, to the atmosphere. Another uh, problem related to, to SRM is related to what is called as the termination shock because uh, an abrupt termination of, of SRM would cause abrupt climate and also water cycle changes. But if we consider a gradual phase out, sorry, this is misspelling, phase out of, of SRM with simultaneous uh, emission reductions, this could be in some way uh, useful to, to diminish the large negative effects of sudden SRM termination. So SRM is uh, quite different to mitigation of climate change. Mitigation is related to a reduction of CO2 uh, emissions to the atmosphere or to removal of, um, of carbon dioxide. So, um, SRM cannot be considered as uh, the main policy response to climate change or to the root cause of climate change, that is the increase of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Uh, we can say that, uh, and the report says that SRM introduces something like a mask to, to climate change problem, uh, altering the year's radiation budget. But if this MAC mass is abruptly removed in a high CO2 emission scenario. Uh, the consequence would be a rapid climate change with uh, negative impacts both on human and, and natural ecosystems. So in summary, uh, some of the main findings and assessments that uh, are in the IPCC report, the, the report coming from working group one and working group two, 
shows that there are still large uncertainties related to SRM and knowledge gaps. More research is needed on this issue. But SRM has the potential to, to reduce risk, but also it can introduce novel risks. And there's some still uh, an, an important institutional and social constraints to, to deployment related to different aspects like, like governance, ethics, and uh, the possible impacts on sustainable development. There's a risk of a termination shock, particularly in a high emission CO2 scenario. And uh, SRM uh, is not an option to to mitigate, for example, ocean acidification. So these are the, the key messages and, and results from IPCC that I wanted to share with, with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ines. Uh, you have uh, very uh, crisply laid out the type, main types of technologies and the key messages, which shows you have clearly stated that uh, SRM is no substitute for mitigation. It is regarded in some literature as supplementation, but this supplement also is construed as kind of a, a discouragement for mitigation. Uh, this is, uh, there is a uh, good kind of understanding that uh, if we go for SRM, then mitigation will further uh, and further be kind of uh, postponed, that is. And also there are other types of risks, termination shock you have mentioned, and also the regional uh, and seasonal distribution of impacts will be great also, because some uh, regions will benefit immediately, some uh, regions may be affected even further by injection of this uh, introduction of this technology. So with these words, now let us hear uh, Janos Pasto, our old friend, now the executive director of the uh, Climate Change Governance Initiative. So Janos, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mizan, and uh, uh, thank you colleagues for participating and for uh, being uh, participants at this event. And thank you, Ines, in particular, because you make my life much easier uh, because you've done such a good job in uh, outlining uh, the main issues about solar radiation modification. Uh, so what I'd like to do is share a few thoughts with you from our experience uh, from C2G, the Carnegie Climate Governance Initiative, as we talk to governments and also non-state actors about these issues. It is our mission to encourage these kinds of conversations, and we do this, but we do that in a way uh, to make it clear that we are impartial about uh, the use or not of uh, SRM or any other uh, uh, climate altering technique. Uh, so that I thought would be useful uh, as a uh, upfront. Also, I would like to thank uh, Gober Shona for inviting us. And uh, it's been a pleasure. It was also a pleasure a year ago uh, to do a session. Uh, at that time, we did that together with the Climate Vulnerable Forum. And I should say that I looked at my notes from that meeting and uh, at that time, I started off by saying that uh, we're in a crisis mode because the world is heading to three to four degrees centigrade. And now after COP26, uh, it seems that maybe the world is heading to a little bit less, uh, more like two to three degrees centigrade. Now that's an improvement, but it's still way too high. And uh, we know that the commitments and the pledges uh, have to be implemented in order to reach even those numbers, let alone the 1.5 that is really, really desired. And of course, uh, we have the war in Ukraine, which may uh, make our life considerably more challenging in the coming years, but we don't know that yet. But coming back again to the session uh, a year ago with uh, Climate Vulnerable Forum, there were three points that I'd like to pull out of that report that I think are quite relevant today. Uh, some of which, uh, Ines, you mentioned. First of all, uh, solar radiation modification, SRM raises governance and ethical issues which are particularly relevant to vulnerable countries. And uh, in order for that to be better understood, it needs capacity building uh, uh, for uh, actors in uh, the vulnerable countries in the global south. The second point that came out of that meeting was that 
justice and equity must be placed front and center of the discussions. And that also means that vulnerable countries need a real place at the table so that they can discuss their views and their experiences and their desires. And thirdly, that there is no proper institutional framework for these conversations to take place. And therefore work needs to be done uh, on those uh, institutional frameworks. So these issues continue to be relevant and I thought it'd be useful to just recall what we did a year ago. Now, in the meantime, as Ines mentioned, uh, we've had the working group one report the working group two report and pretty soon we'll have the working group three report of uh, um, of the uh, uh, six assessment report and i'd like to look at those reports a little bit from a slightly different perspective but essentially with the same kind of message so first of all what is important to say is that no ipcc scenario exists without an overshoot of the temperature sadly that's the reality uh, and even the most optimistic scenario where uh, massive transformative emission reductions are done, carbon dioxide removal begins at a substantial scale, none of which we are doing yet. And even there, there's only a 50% chance of keeping the temperature at about 1.5, actually more like 1.6 degree centigrade. So, and then let alone uh, temperature increases beyond 1.5 degrees. So clearly the highest priority must be to maximize emission reductions because the more we do that now, the less we'll have to do other actions later. But at the same time, the message that we have to take home with is that the overshoot is very likely to happen. The question is actually not whether or not there will be overshoot. The question is how much and for how long. And this is particularly relevant for the vulnerable countries, the least developed countries, but it's actually true for everybody, all the vulnerable people in the rich economies as well. And we have seen that uh, uh, many examples of that as well. So one of the important outcomes of the recent reports is that actually the impacts at today's 1.1 to 1.2 degree warming are pretty bad already. And we see some of that, but it's good to see that in terms of numbers. But what the report also says is that every tenth of a degree counts. And when we get to 1.5, the uh, impacts will be much worse, let alone going beyond uh, 1.5 to 2 and uh, higher degrees. So uh, the world actually, and, and we know that there are limits to we need to do as much as possible for emission reductions, but we also know that we need to do adapt, but there are limits to adaptation. Again, from the working group to report, it's clear that there are limits, both financial, but also engineering, as well as sociocultural uh, limits. So the bottom line is that the world needs to start rec uh, planning how to manage the risks of temperature overshoot. And there are not too many options there, but nevertheless, they have to be discussed. And obviously, the first one is to maximize as much as possible the emission reductions, uh, because without that, everything will get a lot worse. Uh, but we also need to do adaptation, but in a much more strategic way linked to resilient development. And even if it has limits, we need to do as much as possible. But we still have a problem. And even the IPCC recognizes that when we do all that, we may still end up with an overshoot. And there is where social radiation modification may come into question. Uh, and I won't go into the detail because Ines has already done an excellent job in describing the different options. We have to underscore, which Ines also said, that SRM is not a solution to the problem. Only emission reductions and carbon dioxide removal are solutions. Uh, but they could temporarily address some of the impacts of warming uh, while the world decarbonizes the economy and while the world removes carbon from the atmosphere. Now, uh, again, uh, Ines mentioned this briefly, but I just want to go a little bit more in detail. Uh, there will be benefits and risks. Uh, there would be benefits and risks if SRM were to be ever used. The benefit, the potential benefit is obviously the reduction in temperature, and it could be a uh, to slow the increase, or it could be to reduce the actual increase, or reduce the time during which uh, the temperature overshoot will occur. But there will be new risks. And uh, the challenge, and again, in Ines mentioned this, but the challenge that we face is that we have to look at this in a risk risk analysis framework. In other words, we have to look at which world will be better, uh, a world 
uh, that gets higher and higher in temperature and it has its risks versus a world uh, where solar radiation modification is used and that will have its own risks and benefits. And one needs to compare these two and do that in a sustainable development framework because it's not just about temperature. It's about broader societal goals that one needs to move forward. We just commissioned a paper on this. It's just published on our website. So if you're interested, uh, uh, we can send the, the link uh, on the chat uh, even during this call. Uh, but the bottom line is that not enough is known, neither about the science nor about the governance challenges uh, that this new technique uh, would uh, result in. So we need some kind of co-evolution of research on the one hand and governance, work on governance on the other. And that's also something that the IPCC has made very clear. The governance gaps are big and not fully understood yet. And, uh, uh, and governance, we don't just mean action by governments, but we need uh, action by a whole range of actors uh, in society, including civil society organizations, academia, private sector, and of course, uh, governments as well. And um, uh, we also commissioned a paper on SRM governance gaps, which is coming out uh, in the very near future. Now, just a few words in closing that there, because there was one question about the role of multilateral fora. This is something also that was discussed uh, in Gobeshon a year ago. Uh, so there are roles for many different existing international fora, but they're different. They're not the same. And I think it's very important that we look at each one of these. The UN General Assembly can frame the picture in a big picture way in the sustainable development framework in the context of global geopolitical context and security and seek inputs from member states and the rest of the UN system. The UN Environment Assembly together with the Secretariat UNEP can uh, keep under review the risks, the benefits, the governance challenges, and who is doing what in this area. Of course, the IPCC can continue to ask the science as it has been doing, and hopefully more in the future. And the World Meteorological Organization will continue to look at atmospheric science and monitoring. And of course, uh, last but not least, um, mentioning here the UNFCCC, which has to ensure that there is sufficient emission reductions and carbon dioxide removal uh, taking place and adaptation so that we uh, either don't need to look at these other options or if we do, then we need to look at it as little as possible. So um, I would uh, like to leave it at that. Uh, as just to finish on saying that this is great to have this kind of conversation. We do encourage more and more of these conversations to take place. And uh, we hope to be helpful uh, both within this particular discussions and any other activity afterwards on these issues. So thank you, Mizan, and over back to you. Thank you, Janus, for further explicating uh, what Ines has started with. Yeah, there are great risks. Uh, as you mentioned, the risk-risk approach. Both sides, we have risk now. Uh, your argument is to do uh, more research, which risks are greater uh, and for what and how. So with this, let us invite uh, Dr. Salimul Haq, Director of the International Center for Climate Change and Development, uh, who has, I think, sent you a pre-recorded uh, statement. So let us hear Dr. Salim. So Ki, if you... Please put the recording on. Hello there, uh, I'm Salim ul -Haq, Director of the International Center for Climate Change and Development at the Independent University of Bangladesh. Uh, I'm very sorry I'm not able to join you live uh, as I have to do various, various other sessions at the same time. Uh, but it's a great pleasure for me to be here and I want to thank the CTG uh, uh, organizers for organizing this session on solar radiation management or what is also sometimes called geoengineering. Uh, from the uh, perspective of the International Center for Climate Change and Development, 
Uh, we have been uh, thinking about this issue for some time now. And in fact, several years ago, when we uh, held one of our in-person Gobeshana conferences, we had an expert from Harvard University come and present on what does uh, geoengineering and solar radiation management mean? Because it was a new subject and we really didn't understand it and we wanted to know more about it. Uh, so as we've become uh, more aware of it, we have uh, some major concerns about uh, particularly the governance and the decision making on how such technologies might be deployed in future who decides what are the different technologies to start with, because there are a wide range of them. Uh, secondly, who decides which ones to move forward with from uh, the thinking to the actual implementation on pilot scale, and then to the potential implementation at global scale. Uh, these are potentially uh, beneficial, but also potentially harmful uh, technologies of which we don't know uh, how they might affect us. So we need to be very careful and err on the side of being precautionary rather than uh, uh, ambitious and trying things that may or may not work. And so the particular aspect of it that is of concern to us is not so much the technology side, but the governance side. Who will be making the decisions? How will those decisions be made? And on what basis will those decisions be made? And in particular, we feel that no decisions that are going to be globally significant uh, should be made without the uh, prior consent and involvement of the most vulnerable countries, particularly the least developed countries. Uh, and preferably, it should be done under the ages of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which includes all the countries of the world who have uh, uh, ratified the UN Framework Convention. And so that is the uh, the most appropriate governance under which it should take place. Uh, and we should be able to design a system that allows us to um, examine each technology as it's uh, uh, brought forward and to make decisions on whether or not it should go to uh, the pilot stage of implementation and then from pilot to large scale implementation. So far, there aren't any real technologies that have made those leaps, but as we approach the 1.5 degree uh, temperature goal that we have for Paris and the possibility of not reaching it or not staying under 1.5 or even not staying under two degrees, the voices that will be pushing for these geoengineering and solar radiation management uh, approaches will get louder. In fact, they are already getting louder. They are already making the case that we need to use these uh, in order to uh, prevent even more catastrophic temperature rises. So uh, we are not against them, but we are not for them without any kind of governance mechanism, particularly equitable governance where the poorest countries and the poorest people in the poorest countries have a say in deciding what should be used and what should not be used. And we should always err on the side of being uh, safe rather than sorry. And in that spirit that we are looking at these issues uh, uh, in, in hopefully with some good results coming out of them at the end, but certainly it's something that we all need to learn about know more about and then make decisions, informed decisions on what is best and what should be done. And I look forward to the results of this discussion uh, at the end of the uh, Gobeshana conference. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Salim, for uh, your brief statement, but focusing on the governance issue, uh, particularly where uh, the uh, uh, most vulnerable countries and the LDC countries must have a say if any time it comes uh, under discussion uh, of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. And as you mentioned, that there is kind of a movement toward that uh, kind of approach because there is not much mitigation uh, initiatives. But we hope that ambitious mitigation will be the primary solution and uh, next COPs we will witness that. Let me introduce the panelists. Uh, we have, uh, first we have Toshi Mpanu Mpanu, a former chair of the LDC group and now um, 
with the rank of ambassador. He is serving the cabinet of the Minister of uh, Environment and Sustainable Development of the Republic, Democratic Republic of Congo. So, Tosi, our good old friend, you have the floor. Hello, Mizan. Yes. Hello, colleagues. Yes. I hope you can see me and hear yes, me well. Yes, sure. we can see you and hear very, you. Very happy to uh, be invited to uh, make some remarks. Um, however, I'm afraid that uh, what I will say will not be very uh, creative because um, I did hear uh, Janos, I did hear Salim, and uh, very much uh, along the same lines. Uh, I do believe that we are in real crisis. Uh, and, and of course, the LDCs are, are the most vulnerable uh, to um, this um, adverse effect of runaway climate change. Uh, and, and it is true that um, uh, pre-Glasgow and post-Glasgow, we've been um, a little bit better off uh, because many countries have ratcheted up their ambition through uh, the submissions of revised NDCs, yet there is still a gap. And uh, LDCs are still very much um, uh, between a rock and a hard place. And, and I believe that it is um, um, important to explore what could be alternatives to allow us to reach uh, the, the stabilization of global warming. And, and this is why, in principle, I will not be um, necessarily opposed uh, to the conversation taking place. But, but of course, um, I'm fully committed and a little bit biased towards um, what should be our overall priority, which is decarbonization. This is the most reliable, this is the most proven uh, option for us to, uh, to reach uh, 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 warming stability. And, and this is what should be receiving our priority. As regards uh, looking at different options, I think that um, we need to make sure that two prerequisites are in place. The first one is if strong safeguards in order to ensure that whatever we try doesn't pose um, too great a danger. It is important that we use um, a proven technology, uh, uh, options that have um, proven to be reliable. I know, for example, uh, many years ago, people had a hard time accepting CCS uh, because they said that carbon capture and storage uh, while would not be um, an option which is permanent. Uh, you could see those, um, uh, those, those, uh, those, those huge quantities being stopped, uh, be emitted once again. But, but it seems that we find people have gained a greater degree of comfort. And, 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 and this is what we need to make sure of, that whatever we, uh, we, we discuss in terms of solar radiation, um, we, it is something that we really uh, have tested and something we master uh, quite well. So very, very strong safeguards uh, as far as science is con uh, uh, concerned, as far as technology is concerned, so that we don't put ourselves uh, more into harm's way. Uh, we've been trying to get away from uh, the fire of uh, address effect of climate change. And it seems like year by year, we even put, uh, pushed uh, further towards that fire. Uh, so it's important that whatever we come up with is not an accelerator, but ra rather a, a deterrent. So the, the first prerequisite is that one. Uh, the second pre prerequisite, I think Janos has, has mentioned it, Salim has mentioned it, it has to do with the legitimacy of the endeavor. We, make sure, we need to make sure that uh, there is um, proper governance where LDCs have a say, have a seat at the table, uh, and, and the, the one body that provides us uh, the greatest degree of comfort when it comes to being able to engage on a fair basis is, of course, the UNFCCC. Um, is it a conversation parties will be willing to undertake under that helm? That remains to be seen. But whatever fora or whatever uh, government uh, governance under which the conversation takes place needs to be inclusive, needs to take on board all their stakeholders so that the conversation can be as informed as possible and as legitimate as possible. Um, as regards um, 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 other options, um, other 
um, elements to be discussed. I'll be happy to uh, come back again once I hear from other panelists. But at this stage, uh, as uh, some opening remarks, I think I can stop here. And I'm sorry for not being too creative and being very much along the lines of Janos and Salim. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Tosi. Yeah, for bringing out uh, the, some important uh, issues like the former experience of the carbon capture and storage. We all are familiar with the uh, movement and the uh, developments that it has gone through and finally it has uh, been accepted as kind of a strategy for uh, even CDM. And then uh, you have mentioned about uh, strong safeguards, which is, uh, of course, a must, because this is kind of an untested technology, uh, which is regarded by many as human hybrids. Tinkering with nature has got both uh, um, uh, serious implications in terms of uncertainty. Uh, OK, so with this, you, I will invite you later. But let us hear next to our panelist is about uh, uh, Romaric. Uh, Udulain, who is a, a resource officer uh, at the University of Cape Town. So if Udulain, um, if you can focus on what kind of institutions or processes that can uh, help or uh, facilitate uh, under better understanding of this technology or whether LDCs should again engage uh, in this process. So, Romaric, you have the floor. Romaric is not with us. Yeah, um, good day, everybody. Um, I'm Romaric Ozulame from yes. the from the University of Cape Town. Uh, I I think that. Um, Developing countries has a very important role to play to play when it comes to uh, raising awareness of and understanding of uh, uh, of uh, solar radiation management. And the, a, a very good way for them to go around is being able to provide information about how they are going to be affected. And because at the end of the day, they are going to be either the most, uh, who the, the one who will lose the most out of it or to benefit the most of it, depending on whether or not it turns well or not. And it is important that to do that, to do that research is capital and to help provide knowledge on uh, solar radiation management uh, potential over their respective regions in order to initiate discussions about uh, the awareness and the understanding of the potential risk and side effects and benefits of uh, applying such a, such a technology to uh, reduce warming. And of course, there will be there. There are and there will be a lot of governance-related uh, issues. And even there, I I do believe that uh, the least developed countries has have a role, a very important role to play in order to influence the type of governance that could be uh, applied or in in the implementation of solar radiation modification. So that's what I can say about the question. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Marit. Uh, you uh, may be invited later again. But now uh, let me invite uh, uh, another young researcher, a graduate student at Rod Girls University, Mahza bin Rahman uh, from the Impact uh, Studies Department. Impact of climate intervention uh, studies. So, Mahazabin, you have the floor. So, you focus together with other issues uh, uh, whether and how the youth can be involved in the process. Okay, so you have the floor, Mahazabin. 
Uh, hi everyone, this is Mazabin Bohman. I'm a climate change researcher from Bangladesh, but currently I'm doing my PhD in atmospheric science uh, in Rutgers University at US. And also I'm working here in the Rutgers Impact Studies and Climate Intervention Lab as mentioned by Ms. Dr. Mizan. With, I'm working with Professor Alan Brother, who is one of the pioneer scientists in the engineering field. And he is also present in today's meeting. So my personal research focus is on uh, analyzing the impacts of stratospheric aerosol interventions on surface UV and also the agricultural production. And in addition to that, I'm also working uh, with the International Rice Research Institute. So uh, at the very first, I would like to thank actually Dr. Hawk and Yanis and the entire Gobishina team for arranging such wonderful session and also inviting me as a speaker. Uh, actually, Gobishina is very close to my heart. Oh, when I was in ECAT, so I organized Gobishina directly. Then I moved to Erie. And um, I hosted two sessions in last two years. Then this year, again, I moved to US, but despite that, I'm here in Kobeshina again. So I'm very, like, I'm personally very connected with Kobeshina. Anyway, so now I'm coming to my main point. So firstly, I would like to discuss today actually from two dimensions. Firstly, uh, despite being from an LDC country, how I got involved myself as a young generation in studying the impacts of SRM. And also I would like to focus on uh, my views on encouraging more young generation and more young researchers in getting involved in research and governance discussion about SRM. So I have, as I told before that, I have worked for five years in Bangladesh in several national and international research organizations. But from my experience, I have uh, seen that we the Bangladeshis are mostly inclined to climate change adaptation and mitigation. We don't know uh, like much about what is uh, solar radiation modification. In fact, I didn't know earlier. So we don't know what is SRM, then what is stratospheric aerosol interventions, then uh, where it will be deployed or how it will uh, bring benefit or risk to us. But we are the most climate vulnerable countries and we are the one uh, to get most benefits or risk from these techniques if it's deployed. So from that interest, I thought of getting involved in researches uh, in SRM. So now I would like to talk about uh, why do I think that more researchers from the LDC should get engaged in solar radiation modification. So as I told earlier that SRM might be good, might be bad, but its uh, researches uh, shouldn't be only confined to the Western or the developed countries. We the climate vulnerable countries uh, should face, will actually, we will face the most of its consequences. So, and it will have direct impacts on us on our development or economy. So the LDC countries and its people have to understand the positive or negative impacts of solar radiation modifications. Moreover, I think that uh, no global decisions can be taken without engaging the least developed countries, without the consent or concerns of the people of the LDC countries. So therefore we have to engage our people, our policymakers and our young generations in SRM. We need to enhance the capacity and knowledge of our youth so that they understand more about climate engineering and its potential benefits and risks associated with that. So that's why I think that we should be bringing this promising issue to our classroom promote our young generations to do more researches on this. So that's all from me for now. Hopefully I will get back to again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry.
Yes, now you do hear me? Yes. So thank you, Mahzabini. Uh, we have got to listen from a, a youth leader uh, who, who are the future leaders of the world, uh, of our countries, and the need for youth involvement. So uh, with this, now let us uh, come back again to Ines and Janos for your thoughts based on the uh, statements and interventions made by the panelists. Okay. So you have a few minutes each, Ines. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm a researcher at the University of Buenos Aires in, in Argentina. It's a, Argentina is a developing country. And one of the main issues we have as, as researchers, of, as climate researchers, is that uh, we need to uh, involve policymakers in this discussion. Uh, they, they uh, participate in the UNFCCC um, annual meetings and we have our NDCs, but really uh, when uh, an opportunity to extract more oil from, from our land appears as now that there's a war and, and the price of oil is rising, uh, our governments uh, cease uh, or feels that there is an, an opportunity uh, in terms of economy, in terms of a short-term economy and, and climate change uh, moves out of, of the scene of, of the discussion. So uh, our role is to, to involve them, uh, to fully involve them in this kind of, of discussion. So when we have to push climate change in and, and the problems to, to continue with, with fracking and also with offshore uh, oil, um, platforms and they are planning new oil uh, offshore platforms. Uh, the discussion on SRM seems uh, quite far to them because they, they are thinking in the short term and, and the, the economy issues uh, we have in, in, in general in, in all our countries, LS, LDCs and, and developing countries. So uh, we have a great task to, to do and to, to try to, to involve them in this kind of, of discussion. So um, I think in, in some way, in, in my country at least, the discussion on, on SRM is in some way a step back. Uh, our policymakers are really not, not involved in this discussion and and we talk when we talk about climate change. It seems that um, this uh, silver bullet is related more to adaptation than any other um, measures or strategies related to, to climate change. Okay, thank you, Ines. Uh, Janos, you have the floor. Thank you, Mizan, and. Uh... Uh, Ines for further reflections. I, I've already spoken, so I, I don't want to dominate the discussion. I think I just have three and a half points I, I'd like to raise now, and then maybe we'll get back to these issues in the discussion. Uh, Ines, I, you said something just now that I thought was quite interesting. SRM is looked at as a step back. And I, I, th I think that's an important point, uh, because it is, in a way. Uh, even if... Uh, we, we don't know whether one day we might or might not uh, be in a position to make use of this technique, but even the thought of using it is because we have messed up our atmosphere. And uh, uh, so in, in a sense, even thinking about it is a step back. <laughs> so you, you, you're right about that. And that's really unfortunate. If we had reduced the emissions the way it was agreed back 10, 20, 30 years ago, uh, uh, then we wouldn't have to think about these issues now. But the reality is that we haven't reduced our emissions, we, global we, and therefore we may need to at least think about this. The second point, uh, and a, a number of uh, colleagues uh, mentioned this, uh, the question uh, that one broadly addresses is the moral hazard. And that is to say that the use of these techniques, possibly even talking about it, may reduce 
the energy, the willingness, the political will to actually do what we have to do, which priority, which is to reduce our emissions and to remove the excess carbon from the atmosphere. And that is true that that may be the case. And uh, that just simply calls for even stronger governance frameworks that can make sure that uh, the idea of emission reductions and the potential use of these techniques is connected in a uh, in in a in a system that can make sure that one doesn't happen uh, without the other. And uh, but there's another side to moral hazard, which also we mustn't forget, and that is to say that uh, uh, if the temperatures are rising as they are, and if the world continues to do the way it has been doing, then uh, if we don't think about this issue now, how to manage the risk of temperature overshoot later, then uh, we have reduced the possibility for the future generations to deal with it. So moral hazard cuts both ways. And then finally, and this is so important for this discussion because every one of you has mentioned this, is, whatever happens, whether one is for or against, in the discussions, the LDCs, the least developed countries, the vulnerable countries need to have a place, need to have a seat at the table. And then the question is, how, do, how does one do that? How can we make sure that indeed uh, the least developed countries, the vulnerable countries have a seat at the table? And maybe we can discuss some more of that during the discussion. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Janos. Uh, before going to the open uh, discussion, question and answer session, I have just one or two queries to Ines, to Janos, and who are experts in this. I think we didn't discuss about uh, the, uh, for example, the economics and financing part of this SRM, which is extremely important. And then I have another hypothetical question that uh, assuming that uh, SRM like CCS uh, will be discussed under the UNFCCC, assuming. Then, uh, who, which countries, for example, how this governance mechanism will be set up? For example, which countries uh, will lead or dominate or uh, based on technology? Uh, this is, uh, uh, these are questions that we need to think of. Okay, so if you, uh, some of you can respond to these two queries. So anybody, anybody, please take up. Beginning from Toshi to Ines to Janos, the senior experts. Yeah? Uh, apologies, uh, Mizan. Could you shortly uh, summarize the, the two queries? I'm, I'm sorry, I did not. Uh, queries? Uh, the first, the first yeah. question was, we have missed any discussion on the economics of uh, the geoengineering, economics of SRM. The financing, okay. financial needs, for example, we have very good idea about mitigation finance or adaptation finance. Okay, how much yeah. is needed? But yes, uh, about financing of this technology, please. Okay, no, no, I, I think that's a very interesting question, and uh, it kind of brings back to what Ines has said. Uh, the, so there is political will to to do the right thing and undertake uh, decarbonization. But when the price of oil gets to a certain point, people don't consider that being a priority anymore because there's the economic gain. And I think that when you do mitigation, there is um, um, uh, an abatement uh, curve. Depending on which options you want to use, uh, the cost is different. And, 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 and uh, that, that creates sometimes a problem because of the forces of private sector. Because private sector wants to do things efficiently wants to do things cheaply and private sector will try to create some low hanging fruits that they can use without ensuring all the safeguards. So, so indeed, um, it, it will be interesting to kind of look at uh, what abatement costs uh, this uh, SRM brings on the table, because indeed, if it appears to be a, a cost efficient option, uh, th there might be some financial flows <laughs> moving in that direction. And, and, and this is why it is important, as far as the governance is concerned, that we have the right people uh, at the table so that uh, it's not the private sector driving uh, this, um, this dynamic, but we have scientific knowledge around the table. We have political knowledge around the table. We have civil society uh, power around the <sighs> table so that we make sure that it doesn't become just about 
um, uh, um, it doesn't become um, about the opportunity cost between different options, but really what's needed for the planet and what's needed for the people. Thank you. Well, thank you, Toshi, for explaining some of the parts of the question. So any, any other response to this question? And then about uh, the political oh. question. OK. Regarding the economy of SRM, uh, is another factor that, just to add to what Toshi just said, it is uh, whether the implementation of SRM in terms of cost, how is it compared to no action at all and the cost of adaptation, for instance? So is it higher or lower? Those are specific questions that need to be answered. Why considering SRM as a potential uh, way of trying to solve or trying to contribute to the solution to the problem we are facing. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you Marik. Any, any other intervention on this economics of geo? Yes, Janos, please. Yeah, just just to follow Romaric, and I, I fully agree. I think this is this is where the real challenge is uh, when it comes to cost. So first of all, we have the cost of reducing emissions and removing carbon from the atmosphere in order to reduce greenhouse gas concentrations, and that we have to do anyway. So when we look at the cost of SRM, it's not instead of doing all those things, but it's in addition. <laughs> because there will be risks of the temperature overshoot. And what Romaric was saying is, okay, well, how, what, are, what is the cost of the risks of the overshoot versus the cost of, of SRM? We don't really know that very well. There are figures floating around, but it's not really well known. And I think this is the, the area where additional work needs to be done. The second point that you raised, Mizan, uh, a number of speakers have made it very clear that the UNFCCC, particularly for LDC uh, countries, is the place where these things should be discussed. And that's understood because they, they are quite active in it and they have their LDCs have worked out their procedures. Uh, what is not clear is how this issue could actually be raised in uh, the UNFCCC process and to what extent it needs some kind of outside push so that parties actually start looking at this, or to what extent perhaps uh, the stock take, the global stock take that will take next year, take place next year, might actually be the triggering mechanism that will begin to uh, ask uh, parties uh, to the Paris Agreement and to the UNFCCC to think about these issues. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Now uh, let us uh, uh, look at the chat box. Key, okay. is there any kind of important comments in the chat box that we can respond or the panelists can respond to. There are a few comments, but uh, which one to attend? Yeah, there's one question uh, from Jamie. I'd like to know, uh, he, he would like to know, uh, um, uh, a bit more on moral authority. Do we have the right to use this? Is there also any possibility of SRM leaking into potential military application? Uh, what monitoring capacity is required to detect and assess impacts of uh, uh, stratospheric uh, aerosol injection? Uh, do is one type of uh, uh, SRM techno uh, technology. Do developing countries have such capacity to monitor and regulate that? Yes, so here uh, in this uh, comment, there are two or three questions. One is the military aspect of application of this SRM. Then uh, the monitoring capacity uh, of the uh, developing countries, LDC governments. There is also some kind of thinking that some rogue state, powerful rogue state, can unilaterally apply this technology. Um, and so another additional question I will add, there is, is there any possibility that ultimately multilateral process will start thinking of if the, this overshoot uh, really uh, continues to happen? So these are the questions on the table. So please feel free to answer, dear panelists. 
Well, I can say something about monitoring in developing sure. countries. Uh, to, to monitor the, the possible impacts of, of SRM, what we need is to, to monitor the climate system. We, and we have that. We already have that. Uh, we need to monitor temperature, rainfall, runoff, and, and all other uh, variables we, we have in the climate system. But the issue is that if we uh, identify some changes or trends, for example, in, in some of these variables, uh, we need to attribute these changes to, to SRM as we are trying to do that to um, attribute some changes to the increase of CO2 in, in the atmosphere. And to do that, we need uh, more research we need uh, to have uh, more people working on that. We need more resources for that. So uh, to monitor these possible impacts, uh, in some way, the, the discussion is uh, related to the previous question, who pays for that? Who pays for, for this research, for, for the money developing countries and the more vulnerable countries need to, to do this, this research? And, in this point is uh, is related to also to to the attribution of climate change developing countries are uh, minor contributors to to the co2 emissions and we are already uh, paying for for the research to to explore uh, impacts and risk in 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 our region so uh, maybe the 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 discussion could be uh, how we uh, finance this kind of, of research in, in, in our countries, where we can get um, advice maybe for, from senior researchers, not, not only uh, money, but um, maybe uh, in this discussion of governance, we, we can also include the, um, a, a global research uh, network related to, to this, just to, to have uh, in, in developing countries, uh, more uh, senior people working on, on these issues. Thank you, Ines. So any other thought? Uh, I'd like to say maybe a, a small comment, uh, Mizan. Uh, it's, it's interesting to see this analogy with uh, military application. And, and, and two things come, come to mind uh, when I think of the military. The, the first thing is the, the, the sovereign fund of Norway, uh, the, the National Pension Fund. Um, th there is a consensus that, that, that the country has developed uh, through some type of uh, stakeholders consultation where regardless of what return on investment can be made, they will not invest on military, uh, uh, military uh, sectors. So uh, it, it was a conscious case because of a sector which they felt was maybe dangerous, maybe not morally to the point where uh, the, 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 the country felt uh, that they should position themselves. So even if there is potential to make a lot of money on military investment and ensure the well-being of future generations, the fund will not invest in that. So, does it say that um, as regard to SRM, uh, people also uh, thinking about the possibility of military option should also decide uh, when they constitute their portfolio not to send money into it? It's not for me to say. The other thing is about um, the non-proliferation non uh, treaty uh, as regards nuclear weapon. Uh, it's been in place for many decades. I think the international um, uh, atomic energy uh, agency is the authority overlooking at it. So it is a treaty, uh, it is uh, uh, voluntary to join, but people who believe that uh, they need to do the right thing have joined, and then they've in a way given part of their sovereignty to this higher authority to look at it because they gave that higher authority a lot of trust they know that they have a seat also at the table. And, and is that um, one option we should look at when it comes to SRM? It's not for me to say, uh, because like I said, 
uh, when we have done our decarbonization uh, requirements, if we need to go the extra mile, and if it is a viable option, then I would not be opposed. But of course, we need to overcome all the risk uh, which many have associated with this endeavor. Uh, but uh, I just found the military analogy very interesting. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, Toshi. Yes, uh, Janos, please. Yes, just two brief points. But one to follow on on the military issue. So uh, it it does not appear that, uh, or rather, let me put it another way: there are much cheaper and more focused ways to kill people, unfortunately, than using solar radiation modification. Okay. However, however, uh, it is conceivable that the use of this technique could result in pressuring different countries to do something or not. In other words. I'll do solar radiation modification unless you do something. So one could envisage this kind of geopolitical uh, pressures and therefore very important to, re to reflect on the governance uh, implications of this kind of issue and see what the international community can come up with, hopefully before the issue were to arrive. But I think the more important one is the first part of this question, uh, the moral authority. And I, th I think it's, we have to be very clear that nobody has the moral authority to do this. And uh, the most important part of governance in the broad sense of the word is to engage uh, different stakeholders in society to understand better what this technique is, how it imp uh, impacts not just temperature, but sustainable development as a whole, and then figure out some kind of social license to do it or not do it. <laughs> that is the big challenge. And, and uh, uh, this conversation is one small step in that direction. But at the end, that is what we need to do. And then there could be a moral authority to do this or not do it at, at some point in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Janus. Yeah, I request Key to uh, look for some other comments. In the meantime, I have uh, one question again. Uh, for example, uh, through solar, uh, through uh, reduction of greenhouse gases, uh, everybody benefits, and there is not discrimination in that benefit. But uh, uh, impacts of climate change is unequally distributed. So there is kind of an understanding among some circles about SRM that uh, introduction of SRM or application of SRM will benefit some regions more than other regions. So there is an unequal, will be an unequal distribution of benefits. Uh, what do you think of? I think- Any, any question from, any comment from anybody, any panelists, please. Yeah. Um, I think that's a very important point. And definitely some region might benefit more than others. Some might be more into trouble than others. And that's where the governance aspect of uh, solar radiation management is very important. And it should be uh, addressed with a lot of serious uh, thinking and 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 actions and decision-making process. That is very rigorous. And, but also another very important thing is a way for us to know or to have an idea of the potential impact is through research. And already when we look at the mapping of the research of SRM research across the globe, it is clear that the global south where most of the least developed, developed countries are located and middle income countries are located, uh, the regions that are the most under research when it comes to SRM. And I will give you a very simple example, for instance, for the African continent. The first ever SRM research published in Africa on Africa by African researchers was done just two years ago in 2020. And that apply also to uh, Central and South America, Southeast Asia, and many other parts in the global South. And if there is no, if we cannot provide sufficient scientific evidence 
of the potential impact, the potential side effect, benefits, etc. It is very difficult for uh, policy makers, negotiators from the global south to, to negotiate, to discuss the topic because they have they will have then very little understanding of it. And to and even the impact, the potential impact over their own region, they don't know it well because no information is provided to them. But if we have a situation in which they have very good knowledge of their region, the impact on their region, then that can serve them as a very strong tool, a very strong information they can use in negotiation. And, and they can use it as a, a way to influence the way that uh, uh, SRM could be implemented in order to benefit them as the most vulnerable people to the impact of climate change. They can, rather, they can use those information at their best benefit in negotiations. Of course, some region will still have to suffer more than others from the impact of SRM. But the point is to make sure that the benefits or the struggle that will arise from the uh, implementation of such technology is kind of, shall I say, agree on, on the limit we can support and the limit we cannot. I'm not a governance expert, but I'm giving my point of view just based on my understanding of governance, but if at the beginning we show, okay, this is the impact we are going to have, these are the benefits, but at the same time, we are going to experience some side effects, and these are the side effects, and how can we negotiate to make sure that those side effects we are getting can be controlled or we can be compensated from those side effects? That's also a potential way or a potential aspect of negotiating and the, uh, the governance uh, of, of solar radiation management. And of course, as I said, it's impossible to have a uniform benefit across the whole globe. Some will always have to struggle more than others from the implementation of SRM. And the point is, what we need to know is how much struggle would they have to face? Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ramalik. Any, any other thought on this question? Uh, I just wanna add something with sure. Ramalik, like uh, uh, as you told that the different regions will face uh, differently the impacts of the SRM, even uh, within the same country, the impacts might be different. For example, I know about a research that was recently conducted in Bangladesh uh, from the context of SRM. So the other results show that uh, they actually studied it on uh, the SRM impacts on the malaria infection. So I can see from that research that uh, that the SRM uh, if is deployed, then the malaria will increase, but it's not the same in the entire country. Even in a small country like Bangladesh, the uh, impact it will be different. Like in some regions, it will be the impact will be higher, and the some region it will be lower. So uh, all I know is the impact might be uh, different in different countries. But uh, before deploying uh, any decisions, uh, we actually need a consensus from all countries, including the LDC countries. We shouldn't be uh, behind this, and we shouldn't only uh, be the sufferer. We have to have a strong voice in favor or against this when uh, the time of deploying SRM will come. So, and for that, I think uh, there is no alternative to getting directly involved with the research and to know about the ongoing scientific research uh, because we all, 
I know that we have to own this. We have to own this SRM. We have to know that uh, what are the potential risks associated with it. So we may think of, uh, as a LDC country, we may think of uh, collaborating with the universities or the research institutions that are already doing active research on SRM. So there can be like a knowledge sharing uh, seminars or any discussions from scientists to scientists because we have a capital problem, we have a resource problem, but uh, we shouldn't uh, lag behind this. So this will only uh, coping up with the latest research on SRM and all other, to get to know about all other impacts of it will surely open a path for us to help the people of LDC, LDCs to acquire more knowledge in SRM and to get involved in climate geoengineering. So, uh, most importantly, we have to uh, catch up with the rest of the world. Otherwise, there will be an imbalance in the context of the geopolitical issues and the governance issues. So that's all. Uh, thank you, Mahzabin. Yes, you have mentioned about this ownership, for example. But uh, um, most of the, I think, the developing countries still are not on board on this SRM. Uh, okay, because I think the uh, reading still goes that this will further, this will further and further discourage mitigation. So the SRM promoters are playing at the hand of the fossil fuel lobby. That is this reading. So uh, it's a big question whether uh, I see Toshi's hand. Toshi, please come in. Yes, Mizan, I wanted to uh, intervene on the question previous. Uh, and I think yeah. that uh, it's all about equity at the end of the day, because we know we are who are the, the biggest polluters. We are the, the most responsible for this climate change conundrum we're facing. And it is important that there is fairness and equity uh, when we, we implement mitigation. We cannot overburden this, themselves and in rela relative terms, do much more than what is our historical responsibility. So, yeah. so in that sense, it's the same with um, SRM. If it opens the door for some people to do less than they are have to do, uh, it creates indeed an equity issue. And on the other side, when it comes to moral hazards, if it creates too much of a moral hazard, then we had to face it creates also an equity issue. So when it comes to implementation or to possible adverse effects, it all comes down to, to equity. We need to find the right balance. We need to find the right level of un uh, understanding, scientific knowledge, right level of engagement to ensure that there is fairness in whatever endeavor we need to embark upon each one of us. Thank you, Toshi. Any, any other thought on this? about SRM further discouraging mitigation, which is the ultimate solution. Okay, Janos, please. Yeah. Let me just add, because I'm also looking at the clock and I, I, I don't know if I, I get a chance uh, to, to yeah, say so this have, again, but-, 10, but minutes left. 10 minutes, okay, then, then yeah. we still have a bit of time. Yeah. But uh, uh, I, I, I think the-, the it was interesting, Tosi. You 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 focused so much on the equity issue, and that's what I said at the beginning. That's how that was one of the key points from our discussion a year ago in Gobashona uh, with the climate vulnerable forum. So that is clearly there. So then the question is, how do we make that happen? And uh, I think that the opportunity is there in the sense that, in the context of this uh, issue, is that what we see is we have a few number of people from the LDC countries who have done research, who have looked at some of the some of the aspects of the science, the impacts and so on. And there are some who have been looking at the governance issues. And it's it's not a fully fledged network, but it's people who have addressed these issues in different ways, whether it's in the Gobeshona meetings or another fora as well. So uh, so we have the seeds of something. And I think it's it'd be really important in terms of the further discussions to make sure that 
you know, there, I, I saw somebody in the chat mentioning the sacrificial areas in the world, <laughs> you know, and that, you know, those things can't happen, certainly not that way. And it's very important to make sure that the views of this group of countries can be expressed one way or another. So maybe uh, by by uh, con continuing these kinds of discussions, these kinds of exchanges, uh, uh, maybe one can contribute to some specific uh, key messages from an LDC point of view and so on. Uh, and, and, and putting equity in the center, in the front and center of the discussions, that's uh, a way uh, to move forward. Yes, thank you. So we are coming close to our time, almost 90 minutes we have. So I think without further interventions, let me uh, share a few thoughts as closing remarks and call it a day. So we have discussed this uh, emerging kind of uh, technology, which is, remains still very, very controversial uh, because of its positive and negative aspects. As a negotiator, long-term negotiator, I'm afraid that this uh, kind of uh, emission overshoot will continue to happen further because the catch you see is about everybody banking on net zero in 2050. If we are really serious about uh, mitigation, then why that far away, 2015, 50, why this procrastination? Why don't we have a plan for 2025, 2020, 30? We are not having that. We are not discussing about that. Uh, many, many countries are having um, uh, submitting that plan for net zero emissions by 2050. This means the to a total policy of procrastination, a total policy of no action today. Let us wait and see. And so I don't believe in net zero emissions. It's kind of a, a manipulation. And that is where my fear is that overshoot of emissions already is happening and will happen uh, further because negoci in negotiations, I find not much ambitious mitigation proposals. This is where my fear lies that ultimately as a stand back technology, whether gradually this will inch into the uh, decision process uh, at the multilateral level. I personally would very much favor mitigation as the best form of and now cooling the earth and uh, controlling the warming. But uh, possibility may not be uh, opted out you now. Possibility may not be ruled out that gradually if the, the emission level and uh, carbon budget goes down and down, then we are not sure whether this will not be a process uh, for discussion at the multilateral level. So for these, we need better, we need uh, to do research and let us try to understand this, what it is. Otherwise, if that happens someday, then we'll be caught, uh, you know, unaware. And this is not good for the humanity as a whole, for our countries as a whole. So there is no harm in better understanding uh, the process uh, involved. So I think with this, uh, let us call it a day. Uh, thank you very much, the experts and panelists. Uh, you had great thoughts, and I hope you will distribute all these recordings and the summary of the discussion to all the stakeholders so that they can also be better informed about this kind of uh, discussion still under debate, not a kind of uh, process under any official one. Thank you. So, Janice. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very thank much. You. Goodbye, Ines. Okay. Bye bye. Uh, Thank uh, you. Young, bye -bye. young uh, colleagues and Toshi, see you sometime soon, maybe in SB. Bye bye.